Tonight's Gordon Smith lecturer is Steve Burrows, the Executive Vice President for w, uh, WSP USA and Director of Buildings um, for the same firm. WSP, a firm I did not know what about before, so I've, it's, it is even possible to be a dean and learn something. Um, WSP provides design, environmental, and management services to be built to the built and natural environment, drawing on a staff of over 31,500 employees. That makes it bigger than the entire population of Yale, faculty, students, and, and all employees. Um, uh, mainly engineers, technicians, scientists, architects, planners, surveyors, design professionals, and various environmental experts. WSP Global is based in Montreal, Canada, and is comprised of more than 500 additional offices across 39 countries on five continents. I'd like to acknowledge the generosity of Gordon Smith, the distinguished engineer specializing in building enclosure systems, who has endowed this series. Mr. Smith, a 1957 graduate of Yale College, is a great friend both to the college and to this school. As is Mr. Smith's custom, he is with us in the audience tonight, and it is my pleasure to welcome him. In establishing this lecture series, Gordon Smith's intention was to bring to our school speakers who reflect an enlightened pragmatism, that is, who work, whose work combines the highest level of technical accomplishment <clears throat> with artistic excellence. Most of the speakers in the series have been drawn from the engineering professions, as our speaker is tonight. So, uh, such engineers as Jörg Schlake, Robert Silman, Cecil Baumond, Leslie Robertson, Chris Wise, Werner Sobeck, Anya Brazel, and Hanif Kara uh, have all lectured in this series, as have such architects as Myron Goldsmith and Raphael Vignoli. In spring 2014, the Smith lecturer was London-based architect Jim Eyre. Steve Burroughs is the 28th Smith lecturer. Mr. Burroughs has over 30 years of experience in engineering building around the world. He has worked on all types of buildings, including stadia, mixed-use commercial buildings, retails, and leisure development, hotels, and airports. Currently based in WSP's San Francisco office, Mr. Burroughs' main uh, many notable projects include the new headquarters for Apple in Cupertino, California, the Beijing Olympic Stadium, better known as, to most of us as the Bird's Nest, Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, and the city of Manchester Stadium in the United Kingdom, built for the 2002 Commonwealth Games. In 1982, Mr. Burroughs received the BS uh, Bachelor of Science Honors in Civil Engineering, from Liverpool Polytechnic. He is a 2004 recipient of the Brunel Medal and was named a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Steve Burroughs, the 28th Gordon H. Smith Lecturer, as he delivers the lecture. Today is the greatest time in history to be an engineer. So I've just turned this lapel mic on. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? Oh, nodding heads. So that's the case. All right. It's fantastic to be here. I'm going to do a real whistle-stop tour through lots of slides. So first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. So as Robert said, I'm a civil engineer. These are, these are my qualifications across the top. So I, can we drop the lights on the stage a little? Thank you very much. That's good. So now you can see my qualifications even better across the top. Um, so I'm a commander of the British Empire, uh, which is an honor bestowed on me by the Queen. But I'm also a civil engineer. You can see FICE, Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and FASCE, I'm a Fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And if you look in the yellow pages under boring, it says see civil engineers. So my intention tonight is to try and not be boring. Um, I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself. 
So uh, this is me in 1966. I think there's a, is there a pointer thing on here? Or, uh? Oh, here, I've got it. It works here. It's fine. So this is me here. I got two. Yeah. My, my mom says, actually, this is, I went to a Catholic school, and uh, all the boys had to wear ties. They had to wear the gray shorts. You had to wear this sort of greeny sweater uh, or a blazer. And I wore no tie, uh, gray jacket. My, and my mom said I never really conformed to anything. And, um, and I think that's really been the story of my life. And, uh, and I'm going to try and give a bit of advice at the end on what have I learned through that process. By the way, 1966 was a fantastic year um, if, you're, if you're English uh, because, um, you know, uh, we, England won the World Cup in 1966. But much more importantly than that, Eric Cantona was born, who was the best player that's ever played for Manchester United, which is my team. So. <laughs> this, is my, this is my car. So I drive a DRK, a uh, great car. So it was made in my hometown, the town where I was born, and that's why I bought it. Um, and it's a three-wheel car, as you can see. So your driver sits on the back wheel, engine sits on the front two wheels. And anybody who knows anything about engineering knows that three-wheel cars are much better than four-wheel cars. The proof of which is when a four-wheel car goes around the corner, it always tries to lift a wheel. It just wants to turn itself into a three-wheel car. So I save some time and have uh, three wheels from the beginning, so it's a great car, um, but obviously a bit weird. Um, I'm going to talk about this. So, so projects, I'm going to give you a sort of background on what, where I see things are today. Um, what, have, what do I think are the big macro things that are affecting designing buildings today? Uh, and I'm going to base it around this. So, you know, every project we do, we have this balance, time, cost, quality. Time and quality go in one direction, and cost goes in the other direction. I I'm really just going to talk about this. I'm just going to talk about time. So my entire presentation is really about, about time and, uh, and uh, both the past uh, and the present and the future. So let me start. So, so I have been fortunate enough uh, throughout my career to be able to study some interesting things. And, and one, of the, one of the interesting things is that I've been able to go and look back in time. So I, I actually have a, a TV show. Um, so I've had a series of TV shows. The first one I made was the title, the opening title slide. The first show was called Engineering the Impossible, where we actually took um, drawings of Roman cranes in the Vatican Museum and built them in the US. And we actually lifted a Ford F-250 truck with three students inside the wheel. It was like a big hamster wheel. So we were sort of trying to replicate how things were built in Egypt and Rome. Uh, and the latest show I did was, was this. So it, it was really about, oh, I'm going to talk about time. So three periods of history where I think it was a great time to be an engineer. The first one in Egyptian times. Uh, and I, I was lucky enough to go and sort of laser scan the pyramids. So that was basically the show's called Time Scanners. I think you can still buy it. It's been on here, and you can buy it on Amazon or if you're interested in it. But basically, the premise of the show was laser scan an ancient monument, turn it into a model, post-process it using some modern engineering software, and learn something new about how they might have gone about and done it. So, so, you know, I was studying the Step Pyramid. That's the, this is this, the world's first multi-story building. So this was a mastaba, a single-story building. I've forgotten how this thing works. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, this was a single-story building here. And Impotep uh, actually added levels on the building. And in doing so, what I discovered was he understood ground bearing pressure. He understood the, the issue of building a multi-story building and the fact that there was some basic science there, some basic understanding in, in building this building. And it's obviously stood the test of time. You know, it's been around six and a half thousand years or so to date. Um, and it's not in bad shape, you know, to be honest. So we laser scanned it inside and out. Um, you can see that there was a pretty good understanding of engineering theories. This is in the burial chamber. So they were stepping the stones back, corbeling, to create large volumes inside the building. You know, they understood the ground conditions. They understood how to place the stones so that it tied together well. You know, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And, and standing the test of time, you know, what, what, did, what did I learn from the step pyramid? Well, they used consistent materials. They used materials that 
that the thermal properties of the materials were very consistent. So it stood the test of time because one of the things I hate the most about construction today, and apologies to anybody who, who in, involved in these things, is that sticky stuff that goes in joints. Because that allows people to build badly. And what they couldn't do at this time was build badly if they wanted longevity. So, you know, it was pretty interesting. They built well. I mean, the, the, um, the Great Pyramid, uh, we scanned inside and out. I mean, the idea of the, this part of the show was to, to look at four different pyramids and to see how the Egyptians learned from one pyramid to the other. So another great thing they had was a sort of apprenticeship system. So people learned their trade. It was passed down in families over... The, these pyramids were built in a period of, you know, 100 years or so, not much more than that. And they actually passed knowledge down from one pyramid to the next. And you could see by scanning them and putting them together, we could actually see like this. this these are the laser scans of, of the four pyramids that we looked at. Uh, and we can look at them in great details. These scans are accurate to a millimeter. Um, you could actually see how they pass knowledge from one project to the next. Uh, and this is a, an archaeologist uh, from the pyramids who um, you know, was continually amazed by what we found. Uh, because we're using modern technology on ancient buildings, you can always discover something new. So, you know, pyramids were the first time, I think, if I was born in Egypt times, I would have loved that conversation with the pharaoh where he said, you know, I'd like you to build me a pyramid, and I'd like you to build me the tallest building on earth, and to make it the tallest building on earth for about four and a half thousand years. Because um, that's what he did. Imagine that as a brief from a client today. Um, it would be engineering the impossible, right? But they did it. I mean, they did it. This is the timeline. Um, this, is, this is the Great Pyramid around here. You know, not absolutely sure of the dates. Uh, it's that far back in history. But it was the tallest building on Earth until, I think Lincoln Cathedral was the first building that exceeded the height of the Great Pyramid. But for a long time, something in the order of 4,000 years, it stood as the greatest building on Earth. And I know that, that uh, one of the recent speakers was talking about, about this project, um, but you know, how long will that stand as the tallest building on Earth? Um, it will be a matter of five years, maybe, you know, something of that order of magnitude before it's exceeded. Um, so it was a pretty, amazing, um, a pretty ama amazing thing to have built something that lasts as the tallest building on Earth for that time. And you can imagine they were exploring the limits of engineering. So nobody had ever done this before. You know, how did they decide how big to build? They had a schedule, they had time to build within the pharaoh's lifetime. And they were, they were cutting and placing stones. They had to determine the height. They had the ground bearing pressure to work with. Uh, and they did it and it stood there. It's still, you know, an amazing structure today. I also think the second period in history where it was a great time to be an engineer was in the time of the Roman Empire. So this guy, you know, I mean, a pr pretty interesting, this guy... Apollodorus of Damascus, my favorite building uh, on earth, the Pantheon. Uh, I mean, I'm sure I've, there are places better than that that I haven't yet been to, but so far, the greatest place that I've been. I actually had the, the privilege of being inside the Pantheon by myself, just with a cameraman uh, being recorded inside. But, but mathematically perfect, you know, the, the idea of the building, a perfect sphere fits inside the building. And they really were exploring the limits of engineering. So they created this huge roof with but the no ability of the structure to carry tension so everything was in compression and so they what they did is they they made the concrete lighter towards the center so where it needed to be strong and heavy at the at the springing points it was and towards the center they were using ash to lighten the concrete to make it thinner and then they applied load on the outside to counteract the tensile forces that were developing in the roof i mean pretty amazing and 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 you know, it, I mean, again, from the outside, it doesn't, doesn't look an amazing building. But, you know, there's lots of hidden engineering inside. The way they carry that thrust down to the ground with hidden walls is, is pretty incredible. And, and we, we have looked at this building. I've been up right up the outside in a cherry picker looking really close. There are virtually no cracks in the building. I mean, it's hard to imagine. I, I tried to predict where it would crack, and that would be the beginning of failure. You know, the crack will allow water ingress. You know, there will be a point at which the water freezes. That will open up the crack, and there will be sort of gradual deterioration of the structure. Nature always wins in the end, but it's really fighting nature very well. 
there's almost no cracks on the outside of that building, and yet in a total inability to carry tension. Um, quite incredible. Um, these are some shots from inside. Um, and, you know, I just love that idea of the way light comes into the space. Uh, it's just, for me, perfect, pretty well in every regard. It was preceded by this. This is, this is the dome at Bayer, so, uh, which is uh, just north of Naples. Um, this, is, this dome, you know, still obviously exists. Um, this was actually an early idea to try and create something roughly the same scale as the Pantheon. But what they did is, because they were aware that there were these huge thrusts coming off the, off, the, off the sphere, they built it into a hillside. So they actually used the Earth to sort of counteract the forces. Um, and so in the background there, you can see the hill that it was built into. And then all this stuff around here was sort of buttressing to resist that force as the, as the dome tried to flatten out. So you know they were, they were testing on a huge scale, practicing for the real thing. And the Pantheon is the, is the real thing. I'm also an absolute stadium fanatic. I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, not just the bird's nest, but I love stadiums. You know, I love them when they're empty. And I did, in this show, we also explored the Colosseum. And I thought it was interesting to sort of just tell you what we did. So this is uh, Dallas Campbell, who's a TV presenter. So they had to put somebody on TV who looked good and knew what they were doing alongside me. And uh, that was him. And, uh, and, and we had a you know, really good look. We scanned the Colosseum from the air. So um, uh, this is what we did. We, we attached laser scanners onto the skids of a helicopter, flew over the, flew over the Colosseum, and then like, digitally scanned it from the air. And, and that's on the TV show, and it's pretty difficult. Imagine how you film that. Uh, just an example of how difficult it is. This is the sound man. So he had to be in the helicopter with us, but he couldn't be seen. So we've got a cameraman, the pilot, a cameraman, me and Dallas, trying to... Uh, effectively scan it so the cameraman's filming us in the helicopter and the sound man's hidden down behind the seats trying to record what we're saying. Uh, it was pretty, pretty weird, but we did. We flew over it, we scanned it from the air, and then what we did is we recreated this Colosseum completely digitally, and then we did a fire exit analysis from the building. So we put an avatar in every single seat. They're given artificial intelligence and they can decide how they get, which fire escapes they choose. So just like people, when they're in a line, they do, some people will wait and some people are impatient and will change lines. And we compared it to the Bird's Nest Stadium. So we looked at an evacuation analysis comparison, Colosseum versus the Bird's Nest, the Colosseum won. Romans understood fire exit analysis, no question about it. That's not by accident. We also had a look at how uh, it was believed that there was a roof over the Colosseum. The Roman emperor was actually shaded. Um, and we sort of tried to say, we were told sailors put the shades up. So you know, we rented a yacht. Uh, actually, the TV company at this point thought I'd gone nuts because I had this idea, let's rent a yacht and see how hard it is to raise a sail. And they were like, you know, added onto a helicopter and now he's on a yacht. You know, he thinks he's James Bond. But, um, but we did, we, we, and it was really hard work on the yacht. Um, you know, we, um, we had, uh, uh, you know, it was a tough job. But what we did is we got Dallas uh, here uh, to raise a sail just to see how hard it was to winch up a single sail, and then we used the size of that sail. We did a, we basically looked at um, a sun path analysis of the Colosseum. Look, we know where the where the emperor sat. We looked, we took a single sail, and we just moved it around until we shaded that spot. So we knew that that in that zone must have been where the sail was. And then we saw how many people could you reasonably shade if you did a series of sails. And we we think, I think, that the actual shading was not at the top of the Colosseum. It was actually somewhere midpoint halfway down. So, so that's a bit of history, those two times, Egyptian and Roman times, and I believe today is the third time. It's the third greatest period in history to be an engineer. So, so why? So first of all, the construction industry today, and I'm going to apologize a bit before I do this, because I've caricatured it a bit, right? So I'm exaggerating a bit for effect, but hopefully it'll provoke you into, uh, into a response. So construction industry today. So imagine when the pyramids were done, when the Colosseum was done, when the Pantheon was done, there was one mind. The, 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 the architect, architect, engineer, builder, was one person. You know, I like, you know, I, I, I admire Isambard Kingdom Brunel, but it was that single mind. You know, he controlled his projects from, from the idea through to the execution of everything. And we've lost that today in construction. We have, this is a typical 
chart where these are separate contracts. So everybody reports to someone else. The client has different contracts with different people. How on earth could you apply that process to building a pyramid? You'd have no chance at all. Uh, but this is what we do today. Um, we also have, we've, we, we have BIM. Well, we don't really. We have the ability to do 3D modeling. And, and we dream of this, the sort of idea that there is a single, there's a single truth that both the designers and the contractors use to, to develop everything on the project. But there isn't. This is how it works in practice. This is what it really looks like. There's data passing between different people all the time, and there is no single truth. So why do mistakes get made? Well, just look at that on the right. How could you possibly deliver a project with a communication process like that and get a project right? There's, you know, the construction industry hasn't changed much over the, our, our time. So I, I'm not quite 100 years old, but, um, but this is 100 years ago. And I just did a series of slides, which I'll click through quickly, and put a shot from that time of a building being built next to a car from that time. And just as a sort of visual comparison of how the construction industry has developed versus how the motor industry has developed. So that's what, you know, that, that slide, that picture of the construction, for me, could be now. I mean, there's not much different. You still see these climbing cranes up the outside. They've got a concrete building. You see formwork and props in the way. And you can see the sequence of things being sort of built and then enclosed as the building's being constructed. You know, I can see that in many, many projects today. If you go on, 1930s, so steels come, come into being. This is that famous Empire State Building shot. And you see the vehicles change a bit. You know, it's got a bit slicker and white walled tires. And, uh, but, but we're still building steel buildings, much the same way. Stick systems, you know, bolts instead of rivets. Still, still the process is much the same. Lift up the pieces, make them in a factory, lift them up, fit them together. It's a very similar, similar process. My thing, stadiums, this is a, a building a, a, a um, seating bowl on the ground or, or elevated. And, you know, yes, we use precast concrete a lot more, but if it's on the ground, it would still look very much like this. We'd be trying to pour concrete on a slope, wet concrete that slumps on a slope. How stupid an idea is that? But, but we do, and we try, and it struggles, and we tamp it in place, and people vibrate it. Um, and, and the cars come on a bit now. It's got, you know, there's a retractable roof on this car, it's a convertible. So, um, you know, that's getting better. But 1958 was the year I was born, so that's why I use that as a marker. Um, and uh, 1966, the year Eric Cantona was born. Um, this was uh, around the time of this building. This is, you know, that sort of era. Um, and precast concrete started to become, people said, why are we doing all these things on site? Why don't we make the bits and pieces in a factory and just put them together on site? And so they did everywhere. And these sort of uh, precast concrete buildings emerged all over the world, or mostly in the Western world. Um, and, and of course, they hadn't got good enough stuff to stick in the joints. So they leaked and failed, and it was the joints that failed, not the precast concrete, but precast concrete got a really bad name. And so people stopped doing it like that and went back to the old ways. And the cars looks a bit slicker now, but uh, still looks old, right? And then today, um, I picked this project. Um, uh, I, I think this is the uh, Met Office headquarters in Exeter, which is one of my projects, actually, uh, where we actually decided to build a building with no wet trades. So we built a building without any wet concrete placed on site, any, um, any mortar, anything that had water in it. Because water, you know, what we do when we build buildings, we put water in the stuff that, that has to set. And then we spend a lot of time trying to get rid of the water afterwards. And we don't do a very good job of it. And it's that water, the moisture that stays in the buildings, that causes a lot of damage over certainly the early life. And it restricts the life of the buildings. It restricts the time that the building will survive. Uh, cars come on a lot, right? So I really would like that car. Um, but uh, you know, completely different. Also, construction industry. Uh, old slide, but productivity in the construction industry is currently at or about the same level of productivity as it was just at the end of the Second World War. And we're the only industry in the world that could 
um, has that sad fact. Every, in every other industry, productivity has improved greatly, but not in the construction industry. And also, uh, deaths on construction sites, um, you know, these are, uh, it, it's the worst place. Next, mining is actually the worst, but for obvious reasons. Um, but next to it, construction is the place to go um, if, if you want to look for the highest number of deaths uh, on, on, in an industry. It's something to be absolutely, not, you know, not proud of. It's very, it's very sad that, uh, that that is the case. So, you know, manufacturing is a safer place to be than a construction site. And you only have to walk past one to see why stuff being moved overhead all the time. You know, the rate at which people are building. Um, there are lots of reasons why construction is not safe. And, and of course, the industry has this reputation. So, you know, there are studies that show 50% of labor costs on a construction site are, are inefficient, i.e. somebody isn't actually doing something that makes progress. I mean, that's an incredible number. Um, uh, half the time, and, and again, walk around, walk down a, you know, uh, a, a, any road where there's road works, and all you see, all you ever see is somebody standing around. Right, that's, the, that's that inefficient time. And projects, um, although there, you know, in lots of areas have been dramatic improvement over this statistic, but for a long time, uh, projects, uh, outturn cost of projects were in the order of 35% above the tender return price. And that's because the mechanism by which we, we buy these projects is we ask somebody to give us the cheapest possible price. And, then, and so we're always going with the person who has missed something and hasn't got the price right, and they're trying to make it up through changes. And so this, uh, that idea of the, the, you know, the, the original contract is the, is the inflatable dinghy, and the yacht is the change order, you know, is the sort of uh, visual of, of the construction industry. And like I said, you know, I'm caricaturing this for effect, but you know, it's not good. I mean, it's not an industry in which we're proud of the process and the product on, on, a, on a repeatable basis. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I'm saying that things have to change. If, you, if you're a design professional, if you're an architect or an engineer, you know, life these days looks a bit like this. You know, this is our problem. So, you know, we are, uh, fees are under incredible pressure. Expectations are much higher. Time frames for designing are much shorter. People are working longer hours. So, so you know, life can look like this. You know, here's you. Just can't, you know, you can't go anymore. Your boss is telling you to move the load, your workload just keeps getting piled on and the client can't understand why you're not making progress. It is tough, it's a tough time in the industry uh, and I think we all recognize that it's a time that, that's, that's gonna change. So things are not gonna be the same going forward. So how will the future play out? Having completely depressed you, saying the Egyptians and the Romans are better than us. Um, you know, I thought, I, I like this, this quote which you've all heard before. Um, and I thought, you know, I'd apply it to a bit of a look at the future. So, so let me see what, tell you what I think is going to happen. So first of all, there's a lot of future predictions. There are things that, that we can predict with some accuracy, and there are lots of things that we can't predict with any accuracy whatsoever. So, you know, this is a, a famous slide from, from 1992, looking at, you know, what's going to happen with peak oil. Um, you know, is the population going to continue to grow, or will there be... A pandemic and it will wipe out you know large portions of the population uh, will will land get scarce with the population growth and so there'll be a food crisis you know natural resources getting depleted factory pollution you know damaging air quality very hard that you, you could draw any lines on this very hard to predict but there are some things that we know so this is the this is the history of the earth right right from right from the beginning so there's the formation of the earth and, and here it goes through, through time. And we know that when Imhotep was doing the step pyramid, uh, and he, the first use of columns were made by the Egyptians, uh, we know we're in this period of time now, the Holocene interglacial period, started about, about 12,000 years ago. I mean, you know, I'm doing a bit, in the scale of this, 12,000, you know, is about that, um, because the scale is so massive. Um, and, and, and so what? What do we know? We, in, in, that, in that era, we're in this epoch, the Anthropocene epoch. Um, and so here's the history of the Earth again up here. And these are some things, these are just slides taken from, from uh, places around the world. So what is this epoch? This time that we are in uh, started, I believe to have started about the time of the first nuclear explosion on Earth. 
It's the first period in the history of this planet where humans are able to adapt the planet to us. Throughout the rest of the history of this planet, we simply adapted ourselves to the planet. But now, we can do all sorts of things. We can flood valleys, we can build huge you know, cities, like or whatever, or if we call that a city. We can, we can build you know, buildings over large amounts of land. We can s decide to convert places into food. We can get rid of rivers and divert them. And you know, we can actually change the world for the first time in the history of this planet. That is what this period, this epoch, is about. And, and that is happening. Will that ever reverse? I doubt it. So for the rest of, of this, the history of this planet, the less, rest of the history of humankind, we will be doing this. For the first time ever, it was only 50, 60 years ago that this, uh, this ability happened. And of course our planet, this is a very precious thing. So this is, this is, this is the Earth to scale, and this is the drinking water, this is potable water to the same scale in a globe that's available on the planet Earth. And the same, this is the breathable atmosphere available to the planet Earth. So it's very fragile. So we, we, you all know we're in a period where you know, we have the ability to determine the future of this planet, and yet you know, what the decisions we make are based around very fragile things. We know that temperatures are rising. You know, we, can, you know, the, we can argue why and the human contribution to that, but the facts are that temperatures are rising and we've got to deal with it. We also know these things. I think this is a really important thing. We know that this was um, you know, pretty well. I, born in, I was born in 1958. So, so look, you know, look at this. That, that people, in life expectancy, so in Latin America and the Caribbean, when I was born, was 52 average. Uh, if I was there, I'd be dead, probably, um, average-wise. But today, look where it is. I mean, you know, the numbers, what is that, 80? It's huge. And look at the change, you know, the change in more developed regions. Well, I was brought up in a very poor area of the UK. So, you know, I might think, I actually think I'm probably, I was probably closer to Latin America than I was to Western Europe, uh, honestly. So, but, but my life would have been, you know, in that sort of period of time. And now it's up here. So, so people are going to live much longer. And the people who are living longer, this is a sort of graph that shows these are, these are women, females up here, males across here, and this is, this is a sort of the, the, the neutral line uh, of age, so uh, 45 degree. And, and you can see that, that women are living, living much longer in Japan than men, and, uh, and, and, but about the same time in, in Afghanistan. So you can see there's a massive distribution, pretty hard to read how that distribution takes place on the earth, but it actually looks something like this. So this is life expectancy by color. So North America, you can see, you've got a pretty good chance in North America of living into your 80s. Um, pretty good chance, pretty good chance in much of Western Europe, good chance in Australia, okay in Japan. Um, and you can see, you know, in Africa, you know, not so great. Um, and uh, so that's a global life expectancy overall put on the same graph. This is, um, this is the world's richest 1%. Now, this is the 1% everybody talks about. And this is where they live. Hey, guess what? Same place. They all live in North America, Western Europe, China, interesting, and, and Australia. So, so um, what, why are the 1% important? Um, well, they're your clients. Uh, I, I, you know, my entire career, I worked for the richest 1%. And uh, most of the projects, I, you know, I, I would ask, um, yeah, you know, question maybe you can answer at the end, if anybody has worked for anybody who's in the other 99% as a client. Um, but I bet there are very few. So, so these are our clients, and that's where they live, and they live a long time. And uh, this is what's happening with the Earth. We've seen this before. So again, you know, 1900, we had about eight hectares of land for every person on the planet. Today, it's about two. And the prediction is that it will be, you know, one and a half or so. Uh, by, by um, something that approaches the end of your career. Um, so land is going to get more scarce, and that's going to cause food, water, um, you know, uh, taller buildings, denser urban environments, transport, you know, all sorts of issues 
that are going to flow from that with an aging population. You know, that is what you're going to be designing with. So um, I, 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 I love this slide. This is, a, this is actually the album cover to Supertramp's uh, 1970s album uh, of the name Crisis, What Crisis? Uh, but it sort of, for me, it sort of describes it that, that you know, we're, we're, you know, we're happily living in this sort of um, uh, planet damaging situation where, you know, we want to talk sustainability, but we haven't quite figured out even what it means or how we're going to actually implement it. But everything's changing. So what's changing? What's the future look like? First of all, this, you know, exponential change is happening. Uh, exponential is this. You know, every year you get this huge increase in the way things happen. So technology is the most obvious one, but it's happening in lots of different spaces. It's happening in, in medicine. So, you know, the, it, we can now imagine that, that we can cure ourselves of disease without operations. We can imagine that. It will happen. There will be, a, be, a, a, be a, somebody will be able to change our genetic code. What will that mean? People will live even longer. And, and they'll, they, they'll be fitter for longer, but they'll also live longer. So that trend is going to increase exponentially. Life expectancy is going to go up even more. Um, we can do these things now. Um, so th this lady is, is eating chocolate by thinking about it. And she's able to, the, the, this machine is able to take the brain impulse and convert it into movement. And, and I, I believe that what is happening with technology is this. That, that, you know, traditionally, we said that, that if there are architects and engineers, the architects focus on this side of the brain and the engineers focus on there. You know, people like me, they understand the math, we know how to do it, we're rigorous, we get, you know, accurate, you know, precise, but no flair, right? And now, I think technology is actually living in this space. So technology is allowing the two sides of the brain to become connected. And I think, for me, that is overwhelmingly what is happening. And it's happening at a huge rate. Um, and just imagine what that means when, when and I, I've been working on a project which is a, with a startup company where they want to allow engineers, uh, architects to do their own engineering using software without any engineer present so that they can play with it for a while before an engineer gets involved. And so far, our software can get pretty close to DD for structural engineering and you know, definitely beyond schematic for, for mechanical engineering without any engineering involvement, just with an architect putting in the parameters that he wants to achieve in a building. Um, and the reverse could easily be true too. So the brain's being connected. And I, I like this, this is my wife and my, young, uh, my eldest son, Adam. And they went to see a David Hockney exhibition at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. And David Hockney has actually been doing art on an iPad. And what he had produced was mind-blowing. And uh, this combination of art and technology, the, the scale and, 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 and sort of range of what he was able to do was incredible. And that sort of also led me to believe that, that this is possible. This connection of the brain is, is what, what's going on at the moment. And I also thought this was interesting. This, was, um, I, I, this study, I can't remember where I stole this from, but I believe that 3D printing is going to revolutionize the construction industry completely. We, it will be like when I was an, an engineer early days and the fax machine came in, it was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. We can send a letter immediately and rather than the mail. And then email came along and it got even faster. And this is what's causing this overload, this donkey in the air issue that everything is wanted yesterday. And, uh, uh, but, 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 um, so this is the study. 3D printing is going to change everything. But this is an interesting study. Females versus males. And, and what it is here is, with, with the advent of 3D printing, how do people see themselves? So it's funny that in the US and in Mexico and China, and there's just these three examples that are taken here, you know, basically, if you look at this, females associate themselves with the sort of softer side of things, the right brain things. And males with the left brain things. So, you know, artists versus scientists. But in China, and China is a billion people, that is just not true. That is that, the difference is just, these are people just, people being interviewed over social media about how they perceive themselves. That, that, that is a cultural thing that's embedded in us. It's certainly not embedded in, in people who were born in China. 
And so with the advent of, of 3D printing and the ability of more female engineers certainly to come uh, from, from China, I think that you know, we're going to see a lot of projects in, in the Asia over the coming years. We're going to see a change in how things are done. Uh, I believe it's going to be completely different. I also am a sort of really, I'm a real biomimicry fan. I don't think I quite understand what it means. I'm really struggling to really understand what I can do with nature better, but I definitely am sort of into it. You know, I believe that, you know, nature is a superman thing. And, and uh, you know, there are some good things. This is obviously the, you know, the burrs, you know, and Velcro. Well, you know, yeah, yawn. Um, it works. It's a good idea. And maybe, maybe one thing led to another. Um, I, yeah, recently, I, I saw a number of things. There's been a number of things being done about nanotechnologies and micro-scale things. And uh, I saw that, that, they're, they're, that the ability now is to connect a sensor to a cockroach. Yeah. And uh, they can, when there's a building that collapses, they send in the cockroaches who actually find their way through the gaps in these buildings. And by sensors, they can actually find, detect people. So this business of tap, 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 is there anybody there? They, will act, they can actually locate people using the cockroaches. So you can be saved by a cockroach. And, uh, and, and swarming is something else that's being studied a lot in, in science. Um, you know, how can you, uh, a bit like when I started, uh, when finite element analysis was studied at school, I suddenly felt it was an incredible breakthrough that by breaking a problem down into tiny little pieces and setting boundary conditions and, and, and analyzing the pieces, you could suddenly solve something that you couldn't solve as a whole. Well, that's happening now on a biomimicry scale where where you know, this, the idea of flocking and the idea of swarming is, is able to help us solve problems that we couldn't solve before. And the, the old classic, which um, is this, the naturally ventilated buildings are supposed to have been informed by termite mounds. I actually think the reverse is true. I think we design naturally ventilated buildings and look around for something in nature that looks something like it. But there's no doubt that they are very similar, that we can get cooler buildings uh, without any, any uh, energy being put into the system uh, by following uh, this sort of model. Uh, I, I particularly like this. This was a story that I'd read that um, there was, I think it's in Washington, D.C. And uh, what had happened was uh, there was this guy at a company that was spraying pesticides on plants that were invasive plants. And he started to find that the plants were getting more and more resistant to the pesticide. And they weren't, just weren't killing them. And, he's, and he was basically could, couldn't think of any way to avoid going out of business. And so what he invented was the goat. And he realized that the goats would eat the plants, and the plants never got resistant to the goat. And so he's now turned his business from, instead of spraying pesticides, he has a, a horde of whatever. What is, a, what is a group of goats called? What's a collective thing for goats? Anybody know? Faculty. There you go. A faculty of goats. It must be true, he said it. <laughs> there are a faculty of goats that eat the plants. So that <laughs> You're good. <laughs> so this is what I think is happening. You know, we're going way beyond lead. You know, we're going from, you know, all these things. That we've got all these things now where we talk about, you know, net zero engineer buildings and, and living building challenge and all these things. But I believe it's going towards sort of much more natural systems in buildings. So, what, so there's my introduction. I didn't take long, did it? There's my introduction. And uh, so I'm going to say, what, what does this all mean for building design, according to Steve Burroughs, the engineer? Um, so first of all, some things will never change. You know, I really love this uh, fourth bridge in Scotland. Uh, uh, this is uh, explaining the structural system. I mean, just, just great. You know, I love these things. But you know, gravity, or gravity won't go away. We've got to, we're, we're sort of stuck with that for a while. And the design process will always be something like this, you know, blank sheet of paper, some ideas, and then develop, the, you know, develop up the ideas. So some things aren't going to change. And um, uh, you know, the mathematics of doing these things isn't going to change. Uh, how we do it will. It, I, I, at school, I learned to do calculations using a scale rule. I've still got one. I don't use it very much, but I've still got one. And then you know, we had a revolution, 1973. The calculator came along and just completely changed how we do things. And we still really, we're just using computers presently as really fast calculators. But we're on the verge of a breakthrough where we can actually do 
a lot more. A lot of those ideas of swarming and looking at optioneering and doing things differently, uh, as I'll talk about a little bit later. The, the physics, you know, this is the buckling equation, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, you know it, it is how we design columns. Uh, every column in the world designed to the same formula. Um, and those, because that's how they behave. You know, we've done enough testing to know how columns behave. So those things will be the same. But some things have changed. And I thought what I'll do quickly is, is uh, uh, Bill Baker said a career is defined by five slides, five projects, I think, or something. Uh, I hope it's more than that, because I've chosen to show you quick five projects and said, well, how have I applied my engineering knowledge and what I think to a few buildings? Uh, and what can we learn? So, so first of all, this is a, this is a book that was given to me by um, Sarah Kethner, who's a material scientist. I did a project with her, and she gave me a book. She knows I'm into stadiums. And in the book was this photograph. Mexico City, 1986. These people had built their own stadium. They're watching a screen outside, watching the game. And, they covered, and it was raining, so they just created a stadium. And I really love that idea. You know, stadiums are so simple things. And I wanted to sort of explore the, the idea of stadiums. So, this project, uh, this was what done when I was at Arup. So I was the project director for this, for both the architecture and the engineering, forgive me. And, um, and, and the stadium was for the Commonwealth Games in 2002, and then later for Manchester City Football Club. And that's how good an engineer I am. Because as a Manchester United fan, I was responsible for Manchester City Stadium. And that is impressive, I tell you. And uh, so stadiums, stadiums, right? There's a few things you need to know about stadiums. Well, this is, this is a pretty impressive one, 48,000 seats. Uh, this is an outdoor running track, uh, a, a sports center. It's got squash courts and things inside the, uh, inside the sports center. Uh, it's called Sports City. So it's part of a, a master plan developed by EDOR uh, with, with the stadium as part of it. And, um, and stadiums, I, I, you know, I came to learn, stadiums are all based on mathematics. So these are the seats, and they look pretty simple, but, but you have to figure out how they work. So it's all based on sight lines. So the quality of view in a stadium is based on this C value, which is how good the line of that you're, the point you're looking to, the nearest point of the field, how far it is above the person's head above. C60 means it's 60 millimeters above these idealized people. That's how they measure sight lines. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there's a mathematical formula for every seat in the stadium. Uh, and there's some, some differences. So if people are in wheelchairs, it obviously changes the formula a little bit. And you allow for about 1% of the population to be in wheelchairs. And you have to design for cameras and things like that. But basically, the mathematical formula for a stadium is determined by maths. And so what we did for this stadium is we started to look for the first time at parametric tools. So that as the architect who um, develops the bowl changes the geometry, as these things change, the structural design changes automatically. So the architect can start playing options with the structure. So, you know, it was interesting. We thought, we thought about it. This, uh, and, and what we also did is we realized that athletics, you can see the athletics track is about twice the size of a soccer field. And so we designed a two-tier stadium with an athletics track in it and a three-tier stadium with a soccer field in it. And what they did is they built this one first, this one on the left first, and then d we put the bowl underneath, and then they dug it out afterwards and converted it to a soccer stadium. So it works like this. This was athletics, so you can see two tiers on the side, the huge athletics track, and then when it gets converted to soccer, three tiers uh, on each side and the field in the middle. So the, the athletics track was at that level. Uh, when it held the Commonwealth Games. And by playing with the maths, we could get the geometry to perfectly work with the two different things, which hadn't been done before. And, and on, on this stadium, we'd started playing a lot with things that hadn't been done before. So we liked the idea of a light roof. So this roof is supported by these external drums. So, so there's a mast, a, 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 a compression element here with cables supporting the roof. And we actually got the roof so light that the big design problem was it, it went up in the air. It had uplift problems. So we'd created like a, an airplane wing, and it started to blow up in the air. And we actually had to put a cable right across the roof. And, and so you can probably see that profile. See these things out here? Do you just about see them? Those are the tie-down cables to hold the roof down. And we had to put concrete inside the steel and weight the roof uh, because the roof was so light. 
So we were right at the extremes of, of what we could do. You know, normally these stadium roofs are incredibly heavy, and we made one that was incredibly light. Uh, we also started looking at some of these other things. We, we went to um, Cardiff Stadium, where they have sprinklers down all the concourses. And we were in a big crowd, and people were taking their cigarette lighters and lighting the sprinkler heads and setting the water off because they thought it was funny. And we said, well, we're not going to have that. So we want to design a concourse with no sprinklers. So how do we do that? And what we came up with the idea was the food concessions were like in localized places like this where the fire started. That by enclosing the, by putting shutters down so that we could extract the smoke through the top, we, we, we extended the toilet extract fans, put them into the concessions, reversed them, fire rated the ducts and fans, and got rid of all the sprinklers in the concourse. So this is a stadium with no sprinklers in the concourse. I don't think that's been done before. Um, so there were a number of things that were you know, real advances. Another one was Manchester, it rains all the time. That's what Manchester's known for. So because we got this saddle-shaped roof, we put two rainwater pipes on the whole stadium, one at each end at the low point of the saddle, and we stopped the rainwater pipes before a big shaft we put in the ground. So it was, when it rains, it's like a waterfall at both ends of the stadium. You can see it here at night. There's, see the rainwater pipe there? And it just goes into a shaft in the ground. These are absolutely huge, but we made a feature of the rain going down the rainwater pipes. And then finally, these uh, uh, drums on the outside of the building have the ramps that take people up to their seats. But in the center drum, we put all the bathrooms, all the machine rooms, everything that we could take out of the stadium, we put in the center of this. So it's serving several purposes. It's the thing that holds the roof up. It's the thing that gets people up. Inside the drum are rooms that take all the equipment for the building. Um, and so inside the building, it's really clean and efficient. So it was, a, it was an interesting design, probably pushed a bit to the limit technologically. Uh, but it shows what's possible. Um, after that, I uh, did this project with Herzog de Moran um, and uh, uh, Arup. So we were responsible for the engineering and the bowl geometry uh, for the building. And this was an interesting brief. So we, we, we uh, Herzog was certainly interested in exploring ETFE as a material. And uh, the brief for the project was uh, that the project was for two teams, Bayern Munich and TSV 1860. They're the two teams in Munich. And it was going to be hold the opening game for the World Cup in 2006. So, and they wanted each team, that it was a design and build competition, each team had to have it feel like it was their own stadium. So I think there were three or four bidders for the project, and most of them did two entrances, two everything, so that there was a Bayern Munich side and a TSV 1860 side. But we thought to win this, we've really, it's design and build, so cost is probably going to be a big deal. How can we build less? And so we came up with this idea of instead of having two of everything, why not just change the color of the building depending on the team that played in it? So the idea was this, that the, the whole building was clad in ETFE. And you know, if it's a neutral team playing in it, it could be white. If it's um, a TSV 1860, it can be blue, Bayern Munich, it could be red. And even if the national team are playing in it, it can be a multitude of colors. And this is what was built. And, um, uh, you know, it's a pretty simple st structural solution. It's concrete bowl, steel cantilever roof. But exploring ETFE as a material, we were, we were into this sort of idea of lighter-than-air materials. The competition brief actually asked for a retractable roof, and we thought no matter what we did, they couldn't build a retractable roof on the stadium. And so we said, how can we build a retractable roof that you don't build now, but you could do later, and you don't penalize the first phase construction with the weight of a structure that can support a roof. So how do we design a roof that's lighter than air? So the, you know, the, the idea was, could we design a balloon roof for a 60,000 seat stadium? And so we spent a bit of time sort of exploring that idea. And, and you know, these are some things, these are real things. These are inflatable structures. These are air beams. And there's some, you know, that's pretty big space, but 60,000 seat stadium is a whole different scale. So we had a look at that compressed air in beams and what was possible. And you can get, you can definitely cover a tennis court so, uh, with, a, with a structure like this, um, which weighs you know, almost nothing. Uh, and you could deploy it when you wanted it. But you couldn't cover a stadium. So what we came up with was, was this. So this was, we actually worked with the original, the original Zeppelin com company is still in existence. And um, 
we went with them and we came up with the idea of building these zeppelins. This is the parking structure for Allianz Arena. The idea is we tether it and then we would move it about a quarter of a mile over the stadium when we wanted to cover it. So all it was was like a deployed envelope, uh, a, a deployed um, umbrella that covered the stadium when it needed to. And, and you know, people, when we did the competition submission, the client said, no, that's crazy. You, you know, you can't do anything like that. But we were showing this. We were saying, well, people have already done it. So here's my pyramid again. And these are, you know, old airships, which you all recognize. But these are modern airships. This is the size of these things. And we say, no, these really exist. They all already exist today. And so, you know, maybe at some point in the future, Allianz Arena will have a balloon roof, but not today. Uh, bird's Nest Stadium. Well, first of all, it wasn't a bird's nest. Um, you know, I was there when we were designing the competition entry with Ai Weiwei and with uh, 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 Pierre de Morin was, was involved in the team. Harry Guga was project architect. And the idea was that it was Lingby Stone. So we were really following, th this was our idea that, that, that we were told that the grandfathers polished stones for their grandchildren, set them in a wooden plinth and gave it to them when they graduated from school. And we wanted to replicate this idea of a podium, a plinth, and then something that felt natural on top, so random lines. And really, that was the idea that we were exploring. Uh, the mayor of Beijing saw our blind competition entry and dubbed it the Bird's Nest, and that was the end of that. Uh, it was now the Bird's Nest Stadium. And here it is. So this is the water cube. Um, this, is the, this is the Bird's Nest Stadium. Aerial shot. Sasaki did the master plan uh, for the site. Absolutely incredible uh, site. Worked, it worked wonderfully well for the Olympic Games. This is the... The idea of the buildings, I mean, that, that um, both design teams were working at the same time and really um, you know, trying to find a way to, um, to work off each other. That, that, you know, this is a box of water and a box of bubbles and the stadium is just massive and you know, it's just so it's this idea of sort of you know, masculine, feminine and, uh, and, and, and you know, poetic versus exciting. Um, we, d we designed, um, I mean, if we, had, if we could do this again today, it would be different. So 3D printing would help us a lot, but we were having to model all sorts of things on this project. You can imagine it's pretty complex. This is our bid book, uh, our competition bid book, and these are some of the models that we made as part of the bid. This is, her, this is the office that we worked in in Basel, uh, where we were doing the design for the competition. And this is uh, one of my guys, Burkhard Meyer, who's a German engineer, uh, standing next to a mock-up that we did right outside. So we had to walk past it every day and just get some idea of the scale of structure that we were dealing with. Um, the span is about a thousand feet uh, for this structure. So it's, and it's a highly seismic zone. So it's a long way. Um, I, I thought I'd explain how the building works. Because, you know, I, I, I can remember being there at the early stages and saying the scale of this thing is so big, we have to make the structure simple. And we really did. And, and it, you know, quite often I say that to people and they say that can't be true, but it is. So we took, well, basically what we did is we took a series of columns around the building and you can see they're each, the columns are each in pairs. And then we simply did, drew a tangent. This is the inner curve that, that's around the athletics track. We drew a tangent to the curve and we did, so that one would go across there and then across there and this one would go across there and then across there and we did it like this. So, you know, there you can see all the tangents to the curve. You can see how it works. This is just a massive portal frame. I mean, it's big. But it's, but it's a portal frame. So to analyze it structurally is really simple. You know, you simply got, you've got a bending moment at this, this corner here. You know, you've got a bending moment reverses in the middle and you, we put a pin at the bottom. And it's just a, a, a portal frame and they go in two directions. Because it was complicated enough, when you start adding on the structure, you know, the, the, the basically the cladding, these, this is the, because you'll, you'll like this, the, the, this is just the, for the support for the cladding system, basically. So you, if I go back, you can see there's the raw structure. And then all we're doing is, because we've got these holes that are different sizes, you know, just keep your eye on something like that one there, and then you start to see how it's filled in. And by keeping the members the same size, I, I did the, uh, I was the engineer for the Impor Imperial War Museum, which was of the North, which was Daniel Liebskin's first building in the UK. And I really liked the way he played with perspective and tricking your eye. And we were really doing the same thing here. By making the outside size of these boxes all exactly the same, simply changing the wall thickness depending on the stress, that you can't tell which is primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. So it suddenly looks random, but it isn't. You just go back, it's incredibly regular. 
So we turned a regular structure into a random structure, um, you know, just with a trick of the eye. So here's the project in construction. I thought I'd run through a few slides because you've probably never seen this. The Chinese government kept this pretty under wraps. You won't see any construction shots. So you can see the columns are up there. Uh, we looked at a construction method. We designed this parametrically. So our geometry, bowl geometry, and structural design were linked completely. Every time we changed the geometry, we got a new weight of steel out of the project. And it did have a retractable roof in the competition stage, which the Chinese government scrapped uh, for reasons. When they had the collapse in China, you remember they, they had the, they, well, there was the collapse of the airport in, in uh, Charles de Gaulle in Paris. And they had an architect who was working on a project in China. They did a complete review of all the projects. And on ours, they decided to save some money. We'd already received approval, and we simply had uh, our project budget cut effectively, or, or maybe our overrun dragged back a little bit. I don't know, who knows what it cost. Um, so you can see a concrete bowl, pretty simple concrete bowl. Uh, Harry Guggen wanted to make all of the columns that support the bowl not vertical. Nothing could be vertical. And, and I, honestly, I was in that meeting when, we, when he asked that, and I said, what the hell, it's complicated enough. Let's just make no columns vertical. Um, you know, it, we could, it was bad enough as it was, or how could it be worse? And it's worked out. It worked out sort of fine. We set some rules, and that worked out fine. Uh, you can see, you know, get some sense of scale of how big this thing is. Um, you know, look at the crane there, and the you know the buildings around the side. So this is uh, construction uh, with the starting to put the roof pieces up uh, inside. This this inner ring was built on the ground, and then strandjacked. Up, in, up, the, uh, uh, up into place, and held in place, and then the columns were on the outside, and then the beams were put in to connect the two. So you can see this is all this trellising, that staging, that was supporting that in a ring at the time, taken on somebody's phone on a site visit um, quietly. Um, we, we got a few, kept getting photographs like this, some more shots on the outside of the building, uh, some idea of the sort of craneage and sort of complexity of the project, and then it starts taking shape. Uh, you can get up sort of close and personal and see the structure. It's a double thickness structure. This is the outside and there's an inside structure. About 45 feet deep, something like that. Spanning 1,000 feet, span to depth ratio 22, 23, something like that. So not outrageous, you know, it's in the right order of magnitude of things. You can see it next to the water cube and get some idea of the uh, pollution in the Beijing sky at the time, and then uh, more uh, hero shots of what it looked like later on in the construction. Um, nice reflection of the water nearby. The stairs, the way you get up the building, it's complete, it's not clad. So the, the, you can see the support, the structure, the, the cladding is the, the envelope is really just there. That's ETFE single skin stretched fabric there. You can see that piece is filled in. That's finished, and you can see it over there. So. Uh, and then you can see the inner roof here protecting the seats inside on the, on, the, on the bottom layer of structure. Between the two of these staircases that sort of zigzag up the building. So most people go up and down the building in between the structure uh, on these staircases. Um, so Manchester had those ramps on the outside. Beijing has these stairs between the structure. Um, so again, some idea of sense of scale. Uh, they had 7,000 welders uh, trained to do uh, they did 700 kilometers of weld on site on this project. Just think about that after this. You know, five, well, yeah, 700 kilometers of, of weld. So what is that, 4.3 miles or something uh, of, of full strength weld, all tested. Um, again, I think it was the same shot I showed you before. Guys doing the planting, you can get the, some sort of sense of you know, difference in technologies. You can see the cladding very clearly and the extent to which it goes around the stadium there. And then there were all sorts of things. I've got an ashtray, I don't smoke, but it's a bird's nest ashtray that I bought during the Olympics. And then these are the light fittings that were done. And it's uh, one of the ideas in the original brief, they said, we want an iconic stadium. And we spent so much time wondering what iconic was. But basically we said, it's, if you see the building, you immediately recognize where it is. It's immediately associated with that place. So we said, you know, the, English red telephone box is iconic. It doesn't have to be big. It just has to be instantly recognizable. And now this is all over Beijing if you go in, you know, th that, this project is instantly recognizable. Therefore, we think it's iconic. You can light it really well. You know, it's pretty, it, it sort of uh, looks pretty cool in various formats. They're incredibly proud of it. This was the topping out ceremony. If you've ever been to a topping out, usually when a building gets to the highest point, you know, they have a party to celebrate reaching the highest point. 
usually there's about 50 or 100 people there. This is the Chinese version. Um, you know, um, the, the, uh, during the Olympics, this is how the, the, the space worked around the building, and uh, you know, it, it was incredibly efficient. I've been to a number of these major events. This, this was interesting. This was off the, the, this was the uh, 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 South China Morning Post uh, newspaper in Hong Kong. These children were asked to make, uh, I think they're four or five years old, they were asked to make a, a model of a building out of old newspaper that they were really proud of, and they made the Birds Nest Stadium, and they, were, they, got, they won first prize, and they were on the front page of the newspaper. So I just like showing that, because I'm really sort of, I think they did a great job uh, doing it. The uh, opening ceremony and closing ceremony for the Olympics, you know, is in, incredibly dramatic, and I was really interested in how they managed to weave in the sort of the, the stadium itself into the show as part of the opening ceremony of the game. So pretty amazing. A um, couple, of just, I'm going to finish with just a few slides now. Bill Baker talked about, uh, he, when he was showing the end of his Burj Khalifa show, he showed this and he said, look what people are doing. That's one of my projects. Um, so this was Dubai Towers in Beijing, one of the projects that was cancelled. But I show, I show it for a number of reasons that, um, you know, it's pretty complicated geometrically. Uh, you can see how tall it is. These are, you know, world's tallest buildings. And here's the Burj. I mean, it's not as big as that, but this is 550 meters tall, about 1,700 feet. Pretty, pretty tall building. And, and we did a lot of analysis on this building to make it work. What we found was, what was really interesting is that here's the design, sort of basically. And there are very few buildings in the world, tall buildings, that are unstable under gravity. And we found that by actually getting this building and leaning it further back, making it look even wilder, it was more stable. So we were able to analyze this building in ways that we could never have done before the computer power that was available to us at the time we did this. And really, the wildness of this shape was really only governed by getting an elevator to go up the tallest building. So it come up here, and it touches that side there, and it has to get up to this level here or something. And, and that was really as, as, as wild as it got. It was designed around that, that elevator. And it was funny, when I was doing this project, you, know, it's one of the, you do these jobs and they, they come to you in your dreams. And I was walking along one day through a parking lot and I saw this. And it was just a piece of sculpture coming out of the ground. I was like, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. It looked almost exactly like what we were designing at 1,700 feet. So I had to take a photograph of it. Um, Apple Campus. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if these slides are public knowledge, so you'll have to block them from your memory as soon as you've seen them. But you know the idea. It's the... Uh, it's a foster project. Um, this is the parking structure. This is the energy center. This is the building that's got all the press that Steve Jobs uh, talked so much about. Um, the idea is that you know it's a glazed building, circular building, glazed entirely. These are huge glass panels, and therefore it requires some shading. And this is the device. This is the level of detail in design that we were going to to really try and un or, uh, figure out how to bring air into the spaces. Um, so the building was, you know, was, was really designed to the nth detail. Um, uh, the, the, the idea is that it, it's back to those 1960s slides I showed. Precast concrete, these are the pieces for, the, for, the, for it. So we were sort of designing the building, then taking it apart, figuring out where all the pieces were, figuring out how they go together. So these are the sort of things that used to get in Airfix model kits and things like that. So we're producing these for the contractor with sequencing diagrams of how to build a building. So these are videos, they're, um, they're means and methods of putting the building together. Uh, it's a base isolated building because uh, it's seismic. So ways in which you can put the structure together with the systems efficiently as envisaged by the designer. Because one of the things that were lost between the pyramids and today is that the designers don't explain how they envisage a building being built today. And they should because we have to envisage how it's built when we design it, but we don't communicate it. But now we can, because we have the tools in which we can do that. I sort of like this. This is Banksy. Uh, Banksy did this uh, iPhone is a prison. You know, there's a prison building. It's a courtyard. It keeps people outside. And this idea that you're permanently connected to your iPhone, you never escape from, from work. And I, 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 and I saw this Banksy thing and then went, hmm. <laughs> but uh, I, if, I, if you associate those two things, that's purely in your own mind. That's nothing. Didn't come from me. Um, 
But these people were very, you know, this building is 24 hour building, so it just made me think of the, the same thing. So finally, what have I learned um, in my time as an engineer? So yeah, uh, out of all these projects, I, I absolutely believe these are fundamental things that trial and error always exceeds, uh, succeeds over lone genius. There isn't an architect I've ever worked with who's so brilliant that the idea has just got to be delivered. You, there's always, it's teamwork. And trying things out and coming up with ideas and bouncing things around, absolutely vital to get a great building. Wild ideas, you know, balloons as roofs, crazy. But just encourage them. It's out of those wild ideas you get amazing solu solutions. You've got to fail often to succeed. So it doesn't matter if you get things wrong, but you have to fail, otherwise you're not pushing the envelope ever. That there isn't a hierarchy in a design team, that everybody should be equal and has an equal say, and, uh, and it works really well. So this idea of a pyramid, a hierarchy, um, I don't think that's the way in which um, it works. And when you do something great, it's just so addictive to doing something next great that you just want to do it again, so celebrate success always. I think the design process doesn't look like any of those earlier diagrams. The design process looks like this. I was actually in an interview with Nick Grimshaw, and the client said to him, how are you going to get from A to B, Nick? And he, had a, and he got a, um, a, chart, a flip chart, and he drew a line. He said, you think it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like this. And, uh, I, I, and he sort of drew it more, well, he maybe drew something like that, but I think it's sort of like this. But anyway, it's definitely not like that. So um, you know, design process is not linear. That, that, you know, if you challenge conventional wis wisdom, and that I, I just think this is genius, that somebody taking a prosthetic limb at, you know, two and a half thousand dollars a time uh, and turning it into something that costs eight dollars and does the same job, that's the level of, uh, of, of innovation that we want to see in the building industry, not, not, you know, get it down to twelve hundred dollars. And we have to have a change in mentality to, to move the building industry forward, and we can now. Um, if you design, you know, design sustainability, for me, the, the only bit of it that matters is sustain. I mean, if you make something last longer, like a pyramid, then it's just got to be, it's got to be sustainable, right? Its carbon footprint over time is zero, or nearly zero. So if you can make buildings that you love, that last long time, then isn't it more sustainable? So, you know, maybe less sticky stuff, and maybe better quality building, and maybe materials that behave similar thermally, and things will last longer and crack less and, and perform better. Um, and, and I believe it's possible if we think about things differently. I, I also think this is gonna happen, that currently we design spaces like this, the one that we're in, for a temperature range. And then you guys all have to adapt to the space. You know, some people have got coats on, some people have just got shirts on. So you have to change to suit the space. I think it's going to, this, this is people, this is, the this is people in the space, and these are the temperatures at which they're comfortable. Everybody's different. When you get hot, it's your hands and your head that get hot, and when you get cold, it's your hands and your feet that get cold. So spaces will adapt to you. We're going to see a complete difference to designing entire volumes at constant <coughs> temperatures uh, in the future, because we can. The build, just like the, uh, the planet Earth, we can adapt it to ourselves we will find that we can adapt the building to ourselves. And if you think about that, you will th you understand there's many ways in which you could, you could do that and get better and more effective and less energy intensive building performance. The psychology of building use will, be co will come into the design process through data. I think now the impossible, you know, I started by saying engineering the impossible. I think the impossible is possible. The two big points for me are you know, we're now in a period where we control the future of this planet. Let's be, let's do that well. And that technology is connecting our brain, both sides of our brain together like never been possible before. And so that's why I, I submit that it is the greatest time in history uh, to be an engineer. That's it. Who's designed a building for anybody other than the richest 1%? Uh, Alan, are you volunteering 
Yeah? You think so? Not sure. <laughs> Buildings are for the other 99%. <laughs> I, I think well over half our, our uh, portfolio. Well, that's great. That's great. That, uh, in commercial, certainly in commercial firms, that's not true. Um, it's, the, it's the richest 1%. <laughs> or TV. Current uh, status of uh, education for uh, engineers, um, particularly for construction and building. Um, well, it, I mean, there's two sides to that question. So, are, are the schools um, producing people who are capable of doing projects under the current? process and regime? Yes. Um, so I would say that uh, in our business, we, we are building engineers. Uh, the business that, that I'm responsible for are building engineers. And I think the graduates we're getting are absolutely fantastic. What, what I would say is that I, I don't think that we're bringing them into an environment where they can deliver their potential. I think we have the industry has to change because we're getting people who are coming out with ideas that the industry isn't ready for. And there's got to be some, some change. And we're seeing that change. So if you look at um, current construction uh, conferences, for example, you'll see they're around integrated project delivery, P3, different forms of design and build contract. What are those things? They're integrated projects where they're really trying to get back to that idea of whatever the modern version of one mind is. And, and, and so I think the industry is changing, and we're watching it in front of our eyes. We're seeing people try you know, what Forest City have been trying in Brooklyn, you know, to build building modular buildings at huge scale. You know, you, you see wooden skyscrapers and the, poten you know, what the, and the potential of those buildings. There's lots of innovation going on, but it needs a breakthrough. And, uh, you, know, the, you know, innovation, you know, this idea of you get continuous improvement and then step change. I feel we're right on the verge of step change. And then I, I do think the schools are producing talented people who are very capable. I don't think the industry is allowing them to achieve their potential. So I don't think we need a whole change in the, in the education process. Um, eng t engineers that are coming out of school are incredibly talented. I mean, I wouldn't get a job if I came out of school these days. I might not even get through school. I might not even get through school, that's true. Jordan Smith, wait a minute. Do you think that the legal profession is a handicap to engineering creativity for the future? Um, yeah, I, I do. And I, I actually, when I did this, you know, I, had put, I put way too many slides in. I, I had twice as many as this right, right when I started because um, I can't help it. And on some of the slides I had, I was showing, um, it's not just the legal profession. It's the, uh, it's the brokerage, you know, the, real, the, 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 the people who, who, who lease out the spaces. Because we have, to, as structural engineers, we have to design for loads that are at least double what that building will ever experience in its entire life. And so, you know, a lot of the innovations that are being made are then being completely counteracted by, you know, tenants want 100 pounds per square foot capability in this space. No, they don't. They've never, they couldn't possibly get 100 pounds a square foot in that space. It, it there wouldn't be any room to move. And, and they'd have to pile it with filing cabinets. And they don't have any more filing cabinets anymore. It's all computers. But so the, there's that. And then there's the, there's the legal profession, which, you know, have really struggling to get around their heads around the fact that we could transfer a model to a builder and not take on liability that uh, we won't have if we put it on a 2D piece of paper and pass it over to them. Because there's data in that model that we are not guaranteeing. And I just don't think, I, just imagine if we didn't have to pass it over, we were all one. We'd all be working on, on some version of a, of a common data model. And, and it's really the lawyers that are, are, are stopping us doing that. And, and, you know, more fool us if we accept that limitation. You know, we've got to, as an industry, we've got to say, this is what we do, and we're going to, you know, we can do it better. 
And, and you know, I, I, I say that, that we could design buildings at half the cost in half the time if we really wanted to. And just imagine you know, what a difference that would be. With a growing population and urbanization, just imagine how much beneficial to the economy that would be. And um, that, that, you know, that, that's my dream. And I think it's possible in my working lifetime. Thank you for the talk. I had uh, two questions for you. Uh, the first, your, uh, your title is a kind of agitprop for architects. This is the greatest time for the, uh, for the engineer, which could have a message for the architect. But it also reminds me of engineering in, the, in, let's say, the late 70s, which is also a very optimistic time. But, and it has to do with something, a scale that I didn't see here today, which would be a, a, a much larger scale than the building itself. We saw mostly kind of the archi architectural scale today, but what about kind of the engineer today and uh, the, the macro project, the, the infrastructural, the city as an engineering project? And the yeah. second question, why okay. did you end with this slide? Because uh, I believe in freedom of speech and I want to be supportive of what happened and I, I feel strongly about it and, and it emotionally affects me. And, uh, and I just wanted to end, end with it. It's, uh, it's important to me, and I'm making a statement where, where I stand on it. But uh, um, to, answer your, uh, to answer your first question, the, the, in, in terms of uh, cities, the way I think about cities is they're like a living organism. That we can never do. One of the things that, that bothered me a little bit is, and I, and I know we're doing it, it's like a research project. We've got to take steps to get to a solution. But this idea of net zero energy buildings, or living buildings, or buildings that give back to, you know, let's just talk about any energy for a moment. It's really not the way to go. Because if you can plug that building into a city ecosystem, and so that it gives and takes, just like an organism does, you know, you've got to create that circle that the waste product from one thing is the feed product for something else. And we can. If we, if we design buildings as part of a city, rather than, you know, quite often we're given a site and things come to that boundary and then get taken away from that boundary and we think about it like that. If we can think bigger, we can solve the problem much better. Oh, yes. And, and I, I do, and I see, you know, I, I, I worked at AECOM for two years and AECOM have all, the reason I went there was because they have all of these skills within the firm and I believe that they were the only company today in that position where they could actually do that. Uh, I don't think organizationally that they're at that point, but they have the potential to do that. Um, it, it's about working together. So you've got to have you know, transport planners and, and you know, botanists and psychologists and engineers and architects and landscape architects working together on a common framework. And I think city, for me, city plans I'm always, you know, I go to, in San Francisco, we have Spur, and I would go along a, a lot regularly. And I'm always sort of, you know, at the end of it, I, I, I go away feeling, eh. You know, it's, it looks at a, at a block or a region or a height, height to buildings, and I think it just isn't going deep enough to really address the problem of what, does, what will San Francisco look like in 2050. You, we, we've got to address completely different problems to the ones that are being addressed in the plans. So they're just not complete enough. They, they're really looking more, often at the more at the aesthetic, and and you know sometimes at how people use spaces or spaces between buildings, than how they really function and work. Um, and there's something missing. But there's lots of people working at it. You know all these like, you know Cisco connected cities, and again there's lots of people who, they know, they know where the answer is. The question is how do we get there? And I think you know you, you only get to a destination, but you have to identify. A destination before you can plan your journey and I think the destination is known it's really about the journey now uh, it's only a matter of time but uh, but, uh, but it, th that interconnection is absolutely vital yeah. Thank you. It's all about you saved me. It's all about the journey now. We're going 
It's all about the journey. Thank you.